Piatigorsky Foundation, which was named after my grandfather. And it's a public nonprofit. And its mission is to bring live classical music to people who otherwise wouldn't get to hear it. So for now, almost 30 years, I've been performing and also sending musicians all over the country to play in retirement communities, schools, churches, synagogues, libraries, museums, prisons, town halls, workplaces, anywhere where people gather where they don't normally get live classical music. This season, I think we're doing a little over 220 concerts in 23 states. Um, and we have probably close to 15 musicians that run around and do them. I don't do them all myself. I did the first few years. Um, I've done an awful lot of them. I've probably played well over 1,500 concerts uh, for the foundation. Actually, I've never counted, so I don't know exactly. I've just guessed at that. Um, but I am incredibly fortunate to get to play on this cello. Um, this was the instrument that my grandfather, Gregor Piatigorsky, played throughout most of his career. Um, it's 294 years old. It was made in 1725 in Cremona, Cremona, Italy, by Stradivarius. And um, I set it up in a very old-fashioned way. So I'm one of the few cellists left who plays on all four gut strings. Up until Quite recently, even the upper two strings were what they call natural gut, so not wound with any metal. Um, and then finally I gave in and I put wound, wound gut strings. Sorry. <laughs> it's amazing it how you could do that without touching the strings. <laughs> instruments were designed to last. It's amazing. I mean, these days, uh, a refrigerator is not meant to last more than 10 years. Nothing's m meant to last more than 10 years. But the guys who made these figured they were going to last for a very, very, very long time. Um, and there are a few ways that they ensured that they would have structural integrity. Um, one, of the, one of the things that they have is arching. You guys know about arching now. So it means a little belly on the front and the back. This is probably one of the worst cellos to see the arching because Stradivarius made his instruments close to flat. I mean, they're amazingly flat. He was sort of pushing the envelope of how flat could he make the arch and still give it structural integrity. And the result is that he made tremendously powerful instruments. Um, when you have an instrument that has a bigger belly on the front and the back, you have sort of more warmth and more richness right around where, where you're playing it. When you have these flat instruments, they're like laser beams. The sound all goes out, so they actually don't sound that loud very close to the instrument. I can tell you some things about this cello and, and many of the great old Italian instruments. They have this odd quality of not being really loud close by. You play the, if I had a modern cello, you know, a good modern cello right next to me, you'd say, oh, that's much louder. It sounds much louder. But you put the two of them on a stage on a, in a hall that seats 1,500 people, and you go to the back of the hall, and the modern instrument tends to sound far away. And this cello from the back of the hall sounds like it's right next to you. And it's this sort of magical property. And people wonder, you know, how, what is the secret? Is it the magic varnish? Is it the, the wood that he had? You know, they, nobody knows quite what the secret is. Um, I would guess that it has something to do with the overtones and how <coughs> tightly packed the overtones are and that the density of the sound is such that it just cuts through everything. I mean, you can, a pianist can play really loud and somehow you don't have to play loud to get 
have the sound carry over the sound of the piano. It just has that, that quality. And somebody uh, recently told me, I just played a trio concert with a woman named Elizabeth Pitcairn, who um, plays on a Stradivarius violin. And have mm -hmm. any of you ever seen the movie The Red Violin? That's her violin. She has the red Stradivarius wow. violin. Wow. And she told me this word, it's an Italian word, and it has something to do with the brightness of the timbre or something, and it's, I, can't, I wish I could remember the name of, of that word. But it's particular to Stradivarius instruments. Is it coloratura? No, no, it's a, it's a word I'd never heard before. I'd have to text her to find out <laughs> what the word was. Um, but it's kind of neat. I, I should play something for you. I'm not quite sure what to play. Somebody wants to play a piano part. Does anyone want to play a piano part? Our pianist is coming late. One of Leon's students. Huh? Well, I'll just. Does anyone know um, Brooks Colnidre? Yeah, you know that. Do you know what the Colnidre is? Has anyone ever heard of that? The Colnidre is a prayer. It's a Jewish prayer, and it's sung on the night before Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is one of the high holy days. It's the day of atonement. It's the day when Jews ask forgiveness for all of their sins, and they ask to be inscribed in the book of life for the coming year. Back when I was in high school, I was living in Baltimore, and I got a phone call on Erev Yom Kippur, on the night before Yom Kippur. There was a service happening at Goucher College and the cantor had suddenly fallen ill, and he couldn't come to sing the Kol Nidre. And would I come and play it on the cello? And so I did, and it's, it's always had kind of special meaning for me, and now in my synagogue, every year, I play a version of Kol Nidre. Now this, what I'm gonna play for you, is written by Max Broch, who was not Jewish. He was Lutheran, and Scottish, I think. Is he Scottish? He, uh, he included, he, he took this, this Jewish prayer and he stuck a Lutheran hymn right in the middle. So he, it's kind of funny, but I'll play it. It's about 10 minutes. See how long, much I get through.
of it Brooke really transcribed exactly from the traditional melody. What's sort of interesting is that at a certain period, I think some point of time in the 1800s, uh, the rabbis decided to ban this prayer from synagogues and from services. It's a funny prayer. It's called All Vows. And what it means, the words mean that all vows made to God are null and void. It's like a legal document almost. It means everything you, all the vows to God don't exist anymore. Um, and so the rabbis thought this wasn't such a good idea. There are many theories as to why this prayer exists. And one of them is that it was during the Inquisition and that Jews had been forced to convert to Christianity. And so for one day, for the highest holy day, the vow that they'd made to convert was wiped clean, so they were Jews again for one day. That's one of the one of the theories. Well, Jews loved this melody so much that the cantors started trying to put other prayers to this tune, and it didn't work. They tried and tried and tried for years, and finally the rabbis relented and said, all right, they can have the prayer back. So Kol Nidre came back into the Jewish faith. But the it, beginning it, is actually the, the, what you hear. It's exactly what you hear, yeah. It is. Yeah. And it's, and it's a, do we know what Hebraic mode it is? Or is it anything like mode and ovals? Is it one of those? I don't know. Yeah. I so. don't know. But then the rest of it is very interesting, as you said. I mean, yeah. It's just yeah. He goes about halfway <laughs> through. So they traditionally in synagogue, it's done three times. There are three, ver there, and it's done in the piece three times at the beginning, and then the second half is all sort of more fantasy, I guess. Mm -hmm. 